Praise the Lord. Well, close our eyes for prayer. Father, we thank you for this Bible study. Well, bless your name because you brought your people to learn from you today. We're asking, Lord, as your people are so zealous and loving, to come to a Bible study every time, beating all the difficulties on the way. We pray, Lord, you bless your people immeasurably in Jesus' name. Open our eyes, Lord, to see, our hearts to understand what you have for every one of us today. And for our brothers and sisters who are joining us all over this city, Lagos, and all over the country, Nigeria, and all over Africa, and beyond Africa, bless all of us together in Jesus' name. Bless our children, our youths, and our men, our women, fathers, and mothers, newcomers, and old-timers. We pray, Lord, that you open our eyes to see, so that we'll be able to walk in the path of righteousness. Thank you, Lord, for the answer. In Jesus' name, we pray. Good people, give me a good amen. I welcome every one of you to the Bible study today. We're really excited at the things we're going to look at today. I think that many people do not understand the passage we're looking at today. And they might have wondered why Jesus said what he said. How Jesus could have said what he said. And what prompted him to say what he said. We're looking at Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5, chapter 6, chapter 7 is what we refer to as the Sermon on the Mount. Because Jesus gave the sermon as he went up into the mountain. And then his disciples came to him, he opened his mouth and he began to teach them. I'll be coming from Matthew chapter 5 from verse 1. Now we're in verse 22. It says, but I say unto you. And you know that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And if Jesus were to come here in the natural and the physical today, he'll be saying exactly the same thing to you and to me. He'll be saying, but I say unto you. I'm sure for those of us who have studied some English, ordinarily, but does not begin a sentence. That means the Lord must have been talking about something. That's why you'll find at the end of verse 21, there is no full stop. So actually, verse 22 is not the beginning of a sentence. It's the continuation of a sentence. What Christ had begun to say. So we must go back to verse 21. Ye have heard that had been said by them of old time. Thou shalt not kill. And whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. Now he says, but I say unto you. Before we go on, you will see that the Lord is making a difference from what they had heard. From what they had known. From the impression they had of the commandments of the Lord. And we need to go back again and find out who is the lawgiver. Because if we don't know who the lawgiver is, we'll not be able to tell how to interpret the law. You see, sometimes when we send our young people to school, and then they go to study law, and then they come out and they go to the law school, and they come out again and they come to interpret the law, and they're standing a case for somebody, and then it happens to be that somebody has gone against the constitution of the land, the law of the land. And this a young fellow, he has gone through years of studying law. And he's even gone to the law school. He's done his true service. And now he comes to the court. By the way, the judge that is looking at the case happened to have been the one that even wrote the constitution. And this individual now comes and then he's arguing this way and that way. And the judge smiles and says, young man, you can, 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 I, can I talk to you? And then he introduces himself. He says, I'm the one that drafted that constitution. Then it went into a panel a committee. And it came back to me. And I gave the final draft and the final write-up. That thing you are saying that way, although you've gone to law school, it's not like that. It is like 
this that's the situation we have here you see those pharisees they had gone to the law school and they had gone to the seminary of the day and they thought they were equipped to be able to interpret the law of god and here comes jesus christ the very son of god and as he looked at them he said now these pharisees have been interpreting the law to you were they there when the law was reaching were they by the side of the heavenly father when the law was given i have been with the heavenly father from all eternity and here i come now but i say unto you he had the right to say that he had the authority to say that he had the knowledge to say that he had the insights to say that he had the power to say that he had the revelation to say that let's look at uh, isaiah chapter 33 in isaiah chapter 33 we're looking at verse 22 it says in verse 22 but the lord is our judge and the lord is our lawgiver the lord is our king he will save us you'll see find you'll find there it's referring to the almighty god the lord is our lawgiver there's another passage we need to join with that due to uh, genesis chapter 2 49 genesis chapter 49 i'm reading to you from verse 10 the scepter shall not depart from judah if you understand the old testament this is a prophecy concerning christ and it's talking about christ coming as a king and it will have the scepter the authority of the king and it says it's coming from the tribe of judah the scepter shall not depart from judah nor a lawgiver from between his feet until shiloh come and unto him shall the gathering of the people be that's christ unto christ shall the gathering of the people be but the point is he is referred to here as the lawgiver god the heavenly father the lawgiver and then christ by his side also referred to as the lawgiver you understand then that he had a deep insight into the meaning of the law that's why he said now you'll be hearing these people men of yesterday women of yesterday that do not have the depth of the knowledge of the interpretation of the law of god they have told you that it had been said in time past thou shalt not kill but as the lawgiver but as the one by the side of the heavenly father but as the one that has the finality of knowledge as the one that has the depths of the knowledge of that law but i say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment and whosoever shall say to his brother raker shall be in danger of the council but whosoever shall say thou fool shall be in danger of hell fire there's a lot in that verse but it is something you will notice we can say with those other officers that came uh, to the pharisees and they said why have you not arrested him their reply was never man speak like this man and as you look at uh, what jesus christ is saying today and he's saying but i say unto you all you can say is never man speak like this man christ condemned anger that is the evil injurious dangerous temper that precedes doing harm to other people anger that inward hot displeasure the internal heat of wrath that indignation against our brother against our neighbor it was condemned by christ and when he did that he did that as a final judge of all flesh it is a problem with the pharisees the pharisees yes they had read the law but they so interpreted god's law so as to overlook anger in every form and also they excused angry people of all blame it wasn't that they have not read the scriptures it's just the interpretation you see you can so interpret the scripture 
And your interpretation may make you feel you are innocent, you are neutral. And you are even a good person when you are actually a guilty person. And this is something that wrong interpretation does to us. Wrong interpretation will deaden our conscience. You can read the whole Bible through. If you have a wrong interpretation, you will not see anywhere where you are wrong. You know the quotation, you know the verse, you know the doctrine. But because you are interpreting it wrong, you'll feel that you're all right. And let me show you the, uh, the Pharisees, they never felt any guilt. Because even though they had anger, they didn't feel that was bad. Their interpretation had justified them. Luke chapter 4. I'm reading from verse 28. Luke chapter 4, verse 28. And all day in the synagogue, when they heard these things, they were filled with wrath. All of them in the synagogue, no exception. The high and the low, the men and the women, they were all filled with anger. And they didn't feel guilty about it. And if you ask them, are you a murderer? Of course, no. Are you keeping the commandments of God? Of course, yes. Their interpretation made them feel innocent when they were actually guilty. If you look at um, Acts of the Apostles chapter 19. Acts of the Apostles chapter 19. I'm reading from verse 28. And when they heard these sayings, they were all full of wrath. And they cried out saying, Great is Diana of the Ephesians. Now you see these were heathens. These were pagans. They were filled with wrath. And then the religious people who were reading the Old Testament, they were also filled with wrath. The religious people were having the same attitude, the same temper, the same hot temper, the same anger, the same wrath, the same indignation, the same fury, the same rage. As the unbelievers, but it's not, they didn't feel any guilty because they had interpreted the word of God. God wrong in Acts of the Apostles chapter 5 verse 17 Acts chapter 5 verse 17 then the high priest rose up and all they that were with him which is of the sect of the Sadducees and were filled with indignation the anger was there but they never felt it was wrong and you see the anger may be in your heart the anger may be in your family in your home the anger may even show on your face. The anger may show in your comportment, in your appearance, in your body posture, in your body movement or body language. And you may never feel any guilty. You may never feel condemned because your interpretation of that word of God is so low, is so shallow. And it is so void of the revelation of Christ that even though you are guilty and you might be on your way to hell fire, yet you feel innocent. You see, that's what that kind of interpretation, that's what it does in John chapter 7. John chapter 7. I'm reading from verse, uh, from verse 45. I want to show you something here. It says, then came the officers to the chief priest and the Pharisees and he said unto them why have ye not brought him the officers answered never man spake like this man then answered them the Pharisees are ye also deceived what's the implication of that we are right we are not deceived we know the truth that's what they thought you see, your thinking may make you feel you are innocent. And you may feel that you are, you are saved and sanctified and filled with the Holy Ghost. And you are matured and perfect. And yet there is something deadly wrong. And then it goes on in verse, 40, in verse 48. Have any of the rulers of the Pharisees believed on him? But these, but these people who knoweth not the law are cursed. They were saying, we know the law. But these ordinary people that do not know the law, they are cursed. Can you see the idea they had? We know the law. What does the law say? Thou shalt not kill. Are you guilty? No, we are free. 
because they had interpreted the law in such a shallow superficial manner that although they were guilty of anger of indignation of rage of fury although they were guilty of this bad hot temper and almost mad with anger even with the lord jesus christ their creator lord and savior yet they felt they were innocent they thought they were the most righteous people on earth we're looking at luke chapter 16 verse 15 luke chapter 16 verse 15 it says and he said unto them yeah they will justify yourselves before men but god knows your hearts they thought they were righteous and his interpretation that caused that they thought they were real children of god and it's a low understanding of the bible that caused that and now jesus said you hear they we justify yourselves before men but god knows your hearts for that which is highly esteemed among men is abomination in the sight of god luke chapter 18 verse 9 and he spake this parable unto certain we trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others you know why they thought they were righteous their interpretation and if you are there and you are interpreting the bible in such a shallow way and you do not allow the light of christ to shine into your heart you'll be despising other people looking down on other people belittling other people relegating other people to the background and you'll be saying i am all right but let's look at the word of god come back to matthew chapter 5 verse 22 matthew chapter 5 verse 22 but i say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment and whosoever shall say to his brother Reka, shall be in danger of the council but whosoever shall say thou fool shall be in danger of hell fire we're looking at this message it is titled christ's declaration on anger christ's declaration on anger by the way if a philosopher were to come over here and were to talk to you on anger a philosopher will have his declaration on anger by the way if a doctor will come over here and talk to you the doctor will have his declaration on anger the doctor may not talk about hellfire but the doctor will talk about how some chemicals uh, you know kind of uh, stirred up generated and come into a terrible combination in your body and what the anger does to your brain to your nervous system to your mind what the anger does to your blood pressure what the anger does to your thinking what the anger does to every part of you if a doctor were to come here he'll declare something to you about anger if a psychologist were to come here a psychologist a who has studied psychology the behavioral psychology talking about a relationship the psychologist will talk to you about anger and the none of them will have anything to say that is good about anger if a person who has studied human relations international relations were to come here and talk to us about anger that person the international relations expert will have something to declare about anger and then those people are going to tell us what it does and if a marriage a family a counselor were to come here and talk to us about the family and talk about anger just anger that uh, family counselor will have a lot to tell us about what anger does to our families and if the educationists were to come here those who study education those who train our young people they 
trainers, the coach. If you were to come here and talk about anger, they have a lot of stories to tell us. Declaration about anger. But the greatest of them all, the highest of them all, and the most dependable of them all is Christ, the Son of God, our Savior and Lord. And he makes this declaration about anger. And he says, but... I say unto you, whosoever is angry with his brother. I wish I could have a doctor here that knows all about this thing I'm talking about. And he'll tell you, whosoever, you know, the people that have anger in their heart bottled up, stirring up in their heart, how they kill themselves before their time. How that contributes to heart failure. How that contributes to your head being hot. Your mind is hot. Your blood system is not working right. It affects every part of your body. And the doctor will say, whosoever indulges in that anger, anger all the time. I wish somebody who had gone through a divorce will come and tell us, and tell us, you know, she's wanting to go back to the husband now. And she feels if I just go make my way right and get back to my husband. And then I say, can you tell us, come and talk to my congregation about what brought the divorce in your family. And they'll say, well, a lot of things. But all those things, the mother of them all, the origin of them all, the root of them all is anger. I couldn't control my temper. And because of that anger... Anger just scattered my family. I wish I were more gentle. I wish I were more tender. I wish I didn't manifest anger. Let's listen to Christ as he gives us declaration concerning anger. We're going to divide the message to three parts. Number one, Jewish anger under judgment. Jewish anger under judgment. Number two, we're talking about judicial anger of Jesus. The judicial anger of Jesus. Number three, justifiable anger of the just. There's a lot here. We're coming back to number one. Number one is Jewish anger or under judgment. We're looking at um, we're looking at Matthew chapter five, verse twenty-two. But I say unto you. That whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whosoever shall say to his brother, whosoever shall say, Reka, shall be in danger of the council. But whosoever shall say, Thou fool, shall be in danger of hell fire. Jewish anger of the Jews, of the Israelites, the Gentiles, the jungle anger of the gentiles what do i mean by jungle anger you know animals live in the jungle and when you see those animal a lion and a bear or you see those animals when it really comes on them and they have this jungle behavior and you can see the anger and there's nothing like affection or love at all as those animals deal with one another as you look at uh, the world in which we live, you see jungle anger, jungle anger, no law, no order, no control, no sympathy, no consideration, no thinking back, no thinking ahead, no vision, just do whatever your temper calls you to do, jungle anger. Whether it is Jewish anger or Jewish or jungle anger, none is excusable. Everything is uh, under judgment of God. That's why Jesus said that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. If we knew that every time, before you get angry, before you allow the anger to erupt out of your heart, I say, what am I doing to myself? It looks like I'm bringing judgment upon myself. I'm bringing disease upon myself. 
I'm bringing a hot brain, a hot mind. I'm bringing a disturbed nervous system to myself. I'm bringing a disturbed blood system to myself by getting angry. I'm hurting myself more than the people I'm angry at. If we knew that every time, and then we say, no, I want to avoid judgment. I think the reason we get angry so many times and on unnecessary things is because we're not looking at the fire that is burning before us. If you see somebody that is just running on and running on and there is fire before him and he keeps on running in that direction, it looks like he has not seen that fire. The moment you see the fire, you will stop. You will stop that kind of running. And it's because many people do not know that anger will bring judgment, will bring the wrath of God, and eventually can lead to hell fire. That's why they indulge in it. And when Jesus said, Whosoever is angry with his brother, the word brother there means your neighbor. The word brother there means your husband. Means your wife. It means your child. It means your daddy. It means your mommy. It means your father, your mother. It means your manager. It means the subordinate in the place of work. It means the neighbor, the stranger that you had just seen for the first time. It means another human being created by the almighty God. You are created by the same God. And the Lord said, whosoever is angry with his brother, it means a subordinate, somebody who cannot fight back. You know, there are some people, they, they are lower than you are. They don't have your power. They don't have your intelligence. They don't have your money. They don't have your position. And whatever you do to them, they are helpless. They cannot fight back. And the Bible says, even when you are angry against the people that are helpless, and they cannot fight back. And you think you can use your position, your authority, your stamina, your stature. And then pounce on them. It says you are the whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause. Shall be in the danger of the judgment. And then sometimes uh, you might feel that those people, if other people are not able to catch them and punish them, at least I can do something. You are the whosoever. And you think that you are so bold and you you are so courageous and nobody can do anything to you. And you are the whosoever is angry with his brother, his neighbor without a cause, shall be in the danger of the judgment. It says being angry without a cause. That is anger without any provocation. You know, sometimes you are surprised. A husband, a father wakes up in the morning and then he wakes up nothing had happened and there was no quarrel last night and then you say good morning daddy he says don't greet me it's like you know it's angry without a cause your breakfast is on the table leave me alone without a cause i just mean ironing your clothes do you want this get out of my sight how are these people just angry like that nobody is fighting with them it's like Satan. You know, Satan was Lucifer in heaven. And there was no cause to sin. And he was in charge of all the angels. And God was nice to him. And yet, he sinned without a cause. And the Lord is saying, Whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause, there's no provocation. And there's no cause for the anger. And there's no good cause for the attitude. It's a groundless, unnecessary sin that he's doing. It says that is, that's a sinner. Anger without any good cause. Anger without any purpose in that. Anger merely to gratify a brutish passion. To hurt or to harm another person that's sinful. To be hardy and headstrong in anger. To be abusive and outrageous until you say Reka. Or you call that person by a nickname. A name that looks like a dagger in the heart of that individual. Or you say thou fool. You know when you say thou fool, non-entity, unintelligent fellow, dumb, dense, dull, ignorant, mad, foolish. 
You know, those kind of contemptuous words that people use against others. And Jesus said, when you do that, that you're in danger of hellfire. Do you find yourself in such a raging temper? When a person has done something to you, uh, why don't you then seek the face of God until you are free from such anger? In order to be free from eternal judgment. Let's see where it began. In Genesis chapter 4. Genesis chapter 4. Let's see. This is where it all began. In Genesis chapter 4. I'm reading from verse 5. Genesis chapter 4. Reading from verse 5. But unto Cain and unto his offering, he had not respect. But and Cain was very wroth, and a countenance fell. Cain, who are you angry with? I'm angry with Abel. Why are you angry with Abel? Did Abel hinder you to offer the right offering? No. Did Abel offend you in any way? No. Why are you trying to revenge on Abel? Because of your own shortcoming. And because of your own a kind of disobedience to God. Now the Lord has not accepted you. He has accepted Abel. There's, no way, there's nothing to be angry at. If you're going to be angry at all, be angry at yourself. That you didn't do the right thing. And then we're told in verse 6, And the Lord said unto Cain, why are thou wrath? Why are you angry? Why is thy countenance falling? He asked him, you don't have a right to do that. And let's look at Genesis chapter 27. Jewish anger under judgment. In Genesis chapter 27, we're reading from verse 41. Genesis 27 verse 41. And he saw hated Jacob because of the blessing. He saw why are you angry? Let's see in verse 44. Tarry with him a few days until thy brother's fury turn away. Until thy brother's anger turn away from thee. Esau was angry against Jacob. Esau, can I ask you a question? What happened the other day when Jacob made you to swear? Oh, what happened is that I was very hungry. And as, as I was very hungry, I told him to give me some pottage. And Jacob said, no, I'm not going to give you for free. You'll have to sell your birthright to me. He saw, what did you do? I sold my birthright to him. What's the meaning of that? It means I sold the blessing of the firstborn unto my brother Jacob. Now he has got the blessing. You sold it to him. Why are you angry? Didn't you sell it? Was the reason to be angry? You know, many people do not consider the things happening to them today. It's like there are consequences of what happened yesterday. And it is what you sowed yesterday, you are reaping today. Why are you angry? If you are going to be angry at all, be angry at yourself. You didn't do right, Jesus, because you sold your birthright. Here we are now in Genesis chapter 39. Genesis chapter 39 verse 19. And it came to pass when his master had these words of his wife, which he spake unto him, saying, After this manner did thy servant, did thy servant to me, that his wrath was kindled. And Joseph's master took him and put him into the prison. Here again we have anger. What's the cause of the anger here? The wife of uh, Potiphar told him that Joseph wanted to mess up with him. Potiphar, you didn't ask any question from Joseph. Why didn't you check up? You are believing a wrong story. And because you believe a lie, that's why you are getting angry at Joseph. If you are going to be angry at all, it is your wife. Check up your wife. Your wife is not as faithful as you thought. You see how people get angry? They get angry at the wrong thing. And they get angry at the wrong person. And then they act in the wrong way. They never check up. In fact, anger has a way of blocking our memory. Anger has a way of blocking our brain. Anger has a way of removing our logic. Our thinking. Anger has a way of making us think in the wrong way. 
Anger has a way of making us believe the false information without checking up anything from anybody. And that's what happened here. And then you see that kind of anger, unjustifiable anger. In First Samuel chapter 17. For Samuel chapter 17. We're looking at it from verse 28. It says, and Eliab, his elder brother, heard when he spake unto the men. And Eliab's anger was kindled against David. And he said, why camest thou down hither? Uh, you know the story already. It's when David was sent by his father to give Eliab and the other brothers, three of them, to give them food. And to see how the war is going. And then to come back to the father. To start with, the father sent him. And the lad knew that the father sent him. And he had given them the food that the father sent. That he said, I should give you this. And now he's saying, when his anger rose up, why did you come here? You just, I just gave you the food that daddy gave me to give you. That's why I came. Why are you asking? Anger blocked his mind. Anger will make us forget, you know. The people who are helping us, anger will make us forget. The people who brought food to us, anger will make us forget. The information we just had, that they sent me to give this to you, anger will make us forget. And then we begin to behave as if we don't have any information, we don't have any instruction, and we don't have any sense at all because anger just disturbs and disturbs totally a kind of diverts our attention and then he says with whom hast thou left those few sheep in the wilderness i know thy pride they begin to tell lies anger will make us to make statements that are not true i know thy pride by the way this is the david that killed goliath this is the David that killed the greatest enemy of Israel. This is the David that saved a whole nation. Anger will make us disturb the person God is using to save a whole nation. And if those people yield to our anger, a lot of good will not be done. And then it says, I know the naughtiness of thy heart. For thou art come down, that I might see the battle. And David said, what have I now done? I like that answer. Well, don't reply anger with anger. Don't reply a kind of, uh, you know, contradiction, a negative attitude with negative attitude. Don't reply a kind of bad, negative attitude destructive, angry, boisterous, hot temper with the same hot temper. As uh, Elab was saying, what are you doing there? I know the pride and the naughtiness of your heart. He said, what have I now done? Is there not a cause, Eliab? Why don't you just get patient? And then when you see the end of the chapter, you will know why I am here. When you see that Goliath is dead, then you will know why I am here. Is that not a cause? I love that. I pray God will give all of us that spirit. I come to point number two now. Point number two, judicial anger of Jesus. Now, as we study this, you know, there are many times when people study one part of scripture. If I had just read Matthew chapter 5 to you, and then one day you're reading the Bible. And as you read your Bible, you come across Mark chapter 5, chapter 3, rather. Mark chapter 3, verse 5. And when he had looked round about them with anger, that's Jesus. When Christ had looked round about them with anger, he said, I don't understand. Jesus said, We should not be angry. Jesus said, Whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. 
And here is Christ. When he had looked round about upon them with anger. Well, to start with, I need to clear up a point. And this point is very important. Many times when we say, I've decided to follow Jesus, no turning back, no turning back. We also add, I've decided to be like Jesus, no turning back, no turning back. I've decided to pray like Jesus, no turning back, no turning back. I've decided to act like Jesus, no turning back, no turning back. So far, so good. But there are areas where we are not called to be like Jesus. There are areas where we will never be like Jesus. There's some peculiarities of Christ that the Christians can never be like. I'll show you. Number one, he is Lord. You are not called to be Lord. In Philippians chapter, Philippians chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 9. Philippians chapter 2, we're looking at verse 9. It says, wherefore God has also highly exalted him and given him a name above every name. You'll never be equal to Christ. There, there are some areas that are peculiar to Christ that you are not called to be like that. In verse 10, that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. You'll never be Lord in that sense. And it's to the glory of the Father. So number one, he is Lord. You are not Lord. There are some things he did as the Lord that you cannot do. That you are not called to do. So you cannot say, but he told us not to be angry. And he now we are told, he looked around them with anger. I'll explain that to you uh, later. Number two, you cannot be the king of kings and the lord of lords. In Revelation chapter 17 verse 14. Revelation chapter 17. I'm reading from verse 14. These shall make war with the lamb. And the lamb shall overcome them. For he is Lord of lords and king of kings. And they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. You will never be Lord of lords. And therefore there are some things that Jesus did. You must ask yourself. Every time you read about the actions of Christ. Whenever he did something, he said something, you say, why did he do that? Is he doing that just as a man? Or is he doing that as the Lord? Is he doing that as the king of kings? Number three, he is the creator. You'll never be the creator. Because he's creator, he has some prerogatives. And he has some authority that you don't have, that I don't have. In Colossians chapter 1 verse 16. Colossians 1 verse 16. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in the earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. We can never say that about you or about me or about any other Christian. He is creator. And there were some things he did. There were some things he said as a creator. That you cannot say okay. Because Jesus said that. Because Jesus did that. I am going to do it. Maybe not. You must find out. Where did he stand? On what ground was he standing? In what position was he standing? When he said what he said. Number four. He is deity to be worshipped deity to be worshipped in that area is different from us because he's deity to be worshipped you know it's like equal to the heavenly father in hebrews chapter hebrews chapter 1 i'm reading verse 6 hebrews chapter 1 verse 6 and again when he bringeth the first begotten into the world he says let all the angels of god worship him deity to be worshipped and we cannot, we cannot allow you to be worshipped. You know, when Peter got to Cornelius' house, and then Cornelius just stretched himself on the ground, Peter said, please get up. You cannot worship me. I'm a man like you are. 
Therefore, there are areas where you cannot just say, Jesus did that. I'm going to do the same thing. He is deity to be worshipped. Do you remember Matthew chapter 8? Let me read to you Matthew chapter 8. I'm reading from verse 1. In Matthew chapter 8 verse 1, when he was come down from the mountain, great multitudes followed him. And behold, there came a leper and worshipped him, worshipped him, saying, Lord, if thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. And Jesus put forth his hand and touched him, saying, I will be thou clean. And immediately his leprosy was cleansed, deity to be worshipped. Look at um, Luke chapter 24. In Luke chapter 24, we're reading the last verse verse and we're reading verse 52 there and they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy that's deity to be worshipped we're not we're not deity to be worshipped therefore you cannot say everything Jesus said everything Jesus did everything Jesus allowed I'm going to allow no you cannot number five he is savior his savior we know that already and you, you can find the references yourself there's no other name given among men whereby we can be saved except the name of jesus his savior number six is mediator and because it's made only one mediator between god and man you cannot be the mediator you cannot be the savior and then now number seven very important he is judge let's look at john chapter 5 john chapter 5 verse 22 in john chapter 5 verse 22 for the father judges no man but has committed all judgment unto the son he has committed all judgment unto the son that makes jesus christ unique that makes jesus christ very different so when you're reading the scriptures and say jesus said this jesus said this and jesus did this you'll ask yourself on what level on what ground did jesus do that oh he did that as deity okay i cannot do that he did that as the judge of all the earth i am not judge of all the earth i cannot do that he did that as savior you remember how they brought uh, that man and they, they removed one of the tiles and then they dropped the man in front of jesus and he said thy sins be forgiven thee can i then go to any place and just tell every sinner thy sins be forgiven thee because i'm a follower of jesus because i'm a child of god because i'm a believer no i cannot because he said that a savior thy sins be forgiven thee i am not savior so i cannot say that so that's the reason you need to find out why did jesus say what he said now come back to mark mark chapter 3 we're reading from verse 1 now and he entered again into the synagogue and there was a man there was a, a man there with a that had a withered hand and they watched him whether he would heal him on the sabbath day that they might accuse him and he says unto the man which had the withered hand stand forth and he, and he says unto them is it lawful to do good on the sabbath days or to do evil to save life or to kill but they held their peace and when he had looked round about them round about on them with anger being grieved for the hardness of their hearts he says unto the man stretch forth thy hand and he stretched it out and his hand was restored whole as the other do you see something here he didn't pray when we want to heal the sick we are to pray he just says stretch out your hand who is that this is the creator and then this is the judge looking at all of them i brought the light of the gospel to you i explained everything to you and i'm the lord of the sabbath and here i stand 
I'm going to heal this man. Here is the creator and his position of creator. He didn't pray to the heavenly father. When we pray for the sick, when you want to get the sick healed, we have to pray and we have to say, Almighty God, manifest your power. Help this man. Then we quote all the promises of God. And then we come, we pray not in our name, in the name of Jesus, before the person can be healed. But Jesus just said, man, stretch out your hand. And that was all. And the hand became whole as the other. This is the creator. And because it's also the judge, that's why he looked at them with the anger of the creator. Or the anger of the almighty God. So, that, you know, tonight as you go back home and then your dinner is late because we're all coming from the Bible study. My dear, is the food ready? I'm, I'm sorry. I don't know what is happening to this too. And then you looked at her with anger. My husband, are you angry? Yes, I'm angry. But we just learned we should not be angry. At, but Jesus looked around about them with anger. You are not Jesus. You are not creator. Clear the anger away from your heart. You will not be angry at your wife again. We need to love one another. You love your wife. You love your husband. You love your parents. You love your children. Let us love one another. Now let's look at Matthew chapter 23. Matthew chapter 23. I'm reading to you from verse 15. It says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. Did you ever find Peter talking to the Pharisees? Say, Woe unto you. Peter never did it. Peter could never do that. Why? Because Jesus was talking here as the final judge of all men of the whole universe. And Peter knew that. John could not tell the people, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees. No. No way. There's no way John could say that or any of the other disciples because they knew all this that you read here in Matthew chapter 23, Jesus was standing as the judge. And you can tell that at the end. Uh, let me show you. In verse 20, in verse 36, Verily I say unto you, all this generation shall come, all this thing shall come upon this generation. He was declaring the judgment. That will come on that generation. In verse 37, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them, which are sent unto thee. How often would I have gathered thy children together, even as the hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, and ye would not. Behold, your house is led unto you desolate. That's the judge. It's saying I'm leaving. It's like when God left the children of Israel in the Old Testament. This is the Alpha and the Omega. This is the beginning and the last. This is the author and the finisher of our faith. And so you cannot copy him. You cannot say because he said this and because he said that. I'll say the same thing in verse 39. For I say unto you, ye shall see me and ye shall not see me henceforth. Till ye shall say, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. We cannot say that about you. Now come back to Matthew chapter 23. And what I'm reading now from verse 17. Ye fools and blind. How do you understand that? Because Jesus said, Whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whosoever shall say, Reka shall be in danger of the council. And whosoever shall say, Thou fool, shall be in danger of hell fire. And here comes Jesus, and he said, Ye fools and blind. Is there not a contradiction there? Because Jesus said, We must not say, Thou fool. Here is the Creator now, here is deity. Here is the Almighty. Here is the one, the judge of all the earth. And here is the last time he was going to talk to these religious people. You'll find after this chapter, he just now talked to his own disciples about his coming again. Here is the final verdict on that generation. And as a final judge, giving them a final verdict, he said, fools and 
blind. And now he tells them in verse 33, ye serpents and ye generation of vipers, how can ye escape the damnation of hell? Now tell me, who, who can be sure of anybody that has gone to heaven or to hell? Nobody except Christ. Who can say confidently, say, now you are generation of vipers and you are going to get to hell. There's no change. There's no way to reverse it. Nobody except Christ. He was talking as God. He was talking as deity. He was talking as the judge. That's why he said what he said. Now come to Psalm 7 verse 11. Psalm 7 verse 11. And as you look at this verse 7 verse 11. Verse 7 verse 11, you will see God judges the righteous. And when God is sitting as a judge, God is angry with the wicked every day. The anger of Jesus, at the time he called them fool, at the time he called them blind, he was talking as God. He was talking as the king, as the Lord, as the judge of all the earth. And that's the reason why whenever you read the Bible and you see all these things, you ask yourself, can I do that? Am I in a position to do that? And the answer is no. We come to point number three. Point number three, justifiable anger of the just. The justifiable anger of the just. The question is, are there some times when some kinds of anger are allowed? And there are some times when some kinds of anger are justifiable. We must be very attentive now because this is very, very important. Let's come back to Matthew chapter 5. In Matthew chapter 5, we're looking at verse 22. Matthew 5, verse 22. But I say unto you, that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in the danger of judgment whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment and whosoever shall say reka shall be in danger of the council and whosoever shall say thou fool shall be in danger of hell fire if you look at Ephesians chapter 4, Ephesians chapter 4, we're looking at verse 26. Ephesians 4, verse 26. Be ye angry and sin not. As you look at that verse, you know, some people think they need to change the verse. They, they, they change it to mean when you are angry, don't sin. That's not what it says. It doesn't say when you are angry, don't sin. No. It says be ye angry. It's a commandment. Be ye angry and sin not. There are two commandments there. Number one, be ye angry. Number two, sin not. And that's why we need to study the Bible rightly, dividing the word of truth. Now be ye angry. Be ye angry. What does that mean? How can somebody be angry? When Jesus said, Whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause, you are angry at sin. You are angry at evil. You cannot be, you cannot hate evil if you are not angry at evil. You cannot hate sin if you are not angry at sin. If you see a young mother that just delivered her baby and then she looks here and there and did not know that you are watching her and then dumped the baby into the gutter and is just about to run away, you grab her. Why are you doing that? You are angry at that action. You pity her about this woman. Maybe she doesn't have money to feed the baby. Maybe she's a teenager and she's so embarrassed to have the baby. You pity her in your heart, but you are angry at that action. You are angry at sin and then you pity the woman 
Or maybe you are just going by and then you see somebody, a man, and he has lashes in the hand and he's whipping the child. Or maybe he's in your home, in your house as you are there, the man locks the door and he's beating the child and the child is crying and crying and now the voice is fainting away and you are thinking this man inside there may kill this child you are angry at that action you go in there you try to open the door and the door is not a you know yielding to be open you, you kick the door open and you rush in there with your eyes wild why are you doing that to a child you want to kill the child and you take the child out of the man's hand and then you pity the man this man if he dies in this condition where will he spend eternity you are angry at sin but not at the sin you don't beat the man you don't slap the man you don't take the cudgel or whatever out of his hand and begin to beat him no you are not angry at the man but you are angry at his action here you here you have you know your daughter and as you have your daughter, you, you, you taught your child about salvation. And your child is serious about salvation. And then in the morning devotion, your child will, you know, when you read the scripture, your child will bring out some blessings out of that. And then your child is just saying, Daddy, Mommy, thank you very much. I'm going to school now. I'm going to leave for Christ. And while she's going, it is this, uh, you know, boy outside. And then came to your child and you say something and your child said, please get, get out of my way. I'm a child of God. I don't do that kind of thing. And this boy will not give up and runs after the girl and then wants to grab the girl to be embracing the girl. And say, leave me alone, leave me alone. And then you come out as a father. You're not smile. You are angry at that action. You pull that boy away. What are you trying to do? This is my child. Why are you doing that? The way you speak, you'll not be smiling. You'll not be saying, why are you doing that? You want to marry her? Why are you touching her like that? You'll not do that. You're angry. You're angry at sin. But you don't knock the boy. You grab the boy. You pull the boy back. Then you sit the boy down. And then you educate the boy. Don't do that. This is wrong. This is how to get saved. Then you teach the boy about repentance. And then you counsel your girl, your daughter. Uh, don't listen to these uh, boys. They will, they will spoil your life. You are angry at sin. When such things happen, you have to be angry at the sin. You cannot just be smiling. Be ye angry and sin not. Now, there are times it is sin not to be angry. There are times it is sin not to be angry because we are commanded. It says, be ye angry. Since we are commanded to be angry at sin, then it is a sin. If sin is going on and we are not angry at it, let me show you an example. Here is Nehemiah now, chapter 5. Nehemiah, I'm reading from chapter 5. In Nehemiah chapter 5, we're looking at it from verse 1. Nehemiah chapter 5, reading from verse 1. And there was a great cry of the people and of the wives against their brethren, the, the Jews. For there were, there were that said, we, our sons and our daughters, are many. Therefore, we take up corn for them that we may eat and live. Some also there were that said, We have mortgaged our lands, vineyards, and houses that we might buy corn. And because of the deers, these were also that there were also that said, We have borrowed money for the king's tribute. And that upon our lands and vineyards, yet now our flesh is as the flesh of our brethren, our children as their children. And lo, we bring into bondage our sons and our daughters to be servants. And some of our daughters are brought unto bondage already. Neither is it in our power to redeem them. 
for other men have our lands and our vineyards. Now, Nehemiah was the governor of the land and he had the oppression, the injustice that they were oppressing these people and they came to cry to him, all our money is gone. Our children now, we have to just give them, uh, just to be able to mortgage them so we can live. And then he said, and I was very angry when I had their cry and these words. It will be sinful not to be angry at such a thing, at oppression, at injustice, at sin, at evil. When you see evil, you see people being oppressed and you see their lives being taken away from them. Their property being taken away from them. And you have the opportunity and the ability and the position to do something and to rectify the situation. Then you must do it. But you will not do anything if you are not angry at sin. Then look at it now in verse 7. We are told in verse 7 of that Nehemiah chapter 5. Reading from verse 7, it says, and Then I consulted with myself, and I rebuked the nobles and the rulers, and said unto them, Ye exert usury, every one of his brother. And I set a great assembly against them. That's the anger. It's not, you know, crushing them, beating them. That's not the anger we're talking about. Angry at the action, at the sin, at the injustice. And then redressing the issue. He said in verse 11, Restore, I pray you, to them, even this day, their lands and their vineyards and their olive yards and their houses, also the hundred part of the money and the corn and the wine and the oil that she exact of them. And they said, We will restore them. That's, that's the that's useful anger. That's profitable anger. You're oppressing the people. You can't do this. This is wrong. This is bad. And then the people said, we're sorry. We're going to re return everything to them. That's the kind of anger that is permissible. Angry at sin. Then it says, be ye angry and sin not. There's time when anger becomes sinful when anger is sinful and we should never indulge in that kind of thing our time is gone let me show you a few examples numbers chapter 24 numbers chapter 24 i'm reading from verse 10 in numbers chapter 24 verse 10 and balak's anger was kindled against balaam and he smote his hands together and Balak said unto Balaam, I called thee to cause mine enemies. And behold, thou hast altogether blessed them these three times. Balaam had no choice. God said, don't curse the people, bless them. And even when he wanted to curse them, God turned everything to a blessing. Balak, there's nothing to be angry about. The man has no choice. God said, this is what you must do. In verse, uh, 13, in verse um, 13, if Balak, I, didn't I tell you, that's what he's saying, uh, verse 12. And Balaam said unto Balak, speak not, speak I not also to thy messengers, which thou sentest unto me, saying, if Balak would give me his house full of silver and gold, I cannot go beyond the commandment of the Lord to do either good or bad of mine own mind, but what the Lord says that I will speak. But I told you before, you don't have any right to be angry. I told you before that what the Lord puts in my mouth, that's what I will say. And so the anger was not justified. And let's look at 1 Samuel chapter 20 verse 30. 1 Samuel chapter 20. We're reading from verse 30. Here we find the anger of Saul. It says in verse 30, Then Saul's anger was kindled against Jonathan. And he said unto him, Thou son of a perverse, rebellious woman, Do not I know that thou hast chosen the son of Jesse to thine own confusion, and unto the confusion of thy mother's nakedness? That's anger. But 
Was that justified? No. Because you know, even Saul himself at a later time, he said, David, I know that you will reign over Israel. Swear unto me that at that time you will not cut off my house. He knew that. Jo 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 um, this man, that's the son of Saul, Jonathan, also knew. He said, I know, David, my friend, that God has appointed you. To reign over Israel. Swear unto me. Make a covenant with me. When you become a king, you remember me. And you so Jonathan knew, Saul knew, that God had appointed this man David to reign. And so there was nothing to be angry at. Since you already knew that this is the will of God. And Jonathan was just carrying out the will of God. This man Saul did not have a right to be angry. Here we are now, 2 Samuel chapter 12 verse 5. 2 Samuel chapter 12 verse 5. And David's anger was greatly kindled against the man. And he said to Nathan, as the Lord liveth, and as the man that, the man that has done this thing shall surely die. Anger. Now, David had no right to be angry here. Actually, Nathan was telling David his own story. But David did not know. David was the guilty man. He thought it was another man. You have no right to be angry when somebody is doing something. And that thing, you yourself, you are doing it. You know, sometimes people get angry. And then they say, why are you doing that? Why are you doing that? And when you really bring the whole story home, this man that is getting angry, he himself is doing exactly the same thing. And so we have no right to be angry. Look at yourself. Even if you are not doing it today, you did it many years ago. Why it not for the mercy of God, you have been forgiven. God has loved you. God has shown you his grace. And God said, okay, I forget it, but go and sin no more. Now you find another man today doing the same thing that you did 20 years ago. You did 30 years ago. Why don't you just remember, I'm alive by grace. I'm alive because of the mercy and the love of God. If God were angry with me 30 years ago and just killed me uh, because I did what this man is doing today, I will not be alive. That's the reason we don't have a right to be angry at our brother, at our sister. Even the people that sin. Yes, we're angry at their sin. We're angry at their evil. But we don't want them to die. Because we have done something greater than whatever they have done. We have to be very careful and we don't manifest all this kind of anger. In 2 Chronicles chapter 25. 2 Chronicles chapter 25. I'm reading to you from verse 7. But there came a man of God to him saying, O king, let not the army of Israel go with thee. For the Lord is not with Israel to weed with all the children of Ephraim. This man, Amaziah, he was going to war. And as he was going to war, he employed uh, the children of Israel, the Ephraimites. The man of God came to him and said, you didn't do well. These people, God is not with them. Send them back home. And now in verse 10, then Amaziah separated them to which the army that was come to him out of Ephraim to go home again. Just because the Lord told him, send them back. And then we're told, wherefore their anger was greatly kindled against Judah. And they returned home in great anger. Why should they be angry? Amaziah wanted them. He loved them. But God told Amaziah, don't allow them to go with you. And Amaziah is doing his best to obey the Lord. In the obedience to the Lord, he said, well, I wanted to go with you. But I'm sorry. The Lord has told me not to allow you to go. And then they became angry. Why are we angry at something like that? You know, somebody comes to you and he says, my brother, I'm sorry. Uh, when I gave you that promise, I didn't pray. Now, after I've given you the promise, my conscience is just knocking me and striking me. I did something wrong. And the Lord is saying I should not do that thing again. It's not me. I would have done it. I wanted to do it. But the Lord is saying I should not do that thing again. And then you get angry. Why are you angry? 
Why are we angry at somebody who is just being sincere with us? And he says, this is what God is telling me. He doesn't want me to go that direction. Again, let's be very careful. We're not just getting angry unnecessarily. Daniel chapter 2. In Daniel chapter 2, I'm reading to you from verse 10. Daniel chapter 2 verse 10. The story here is that Nebuchadnezzar had a dream. Then he forgot the dream. And he called these people and he said, interpret my dream for me. Then they said, well, tell us the dream. We're going to interpret it for you. Well, he said, I've forgotten. And then they said, nobody has ever asked anybody to interpret a dream that you can't tell. And the man got angry. Nebuchadnezzar, who is more guilty? You had the dream and you forgot it. I didn't have the dream. And I say, tell me the dream. Are you angry at me? Why are you angry? You see why people are angry? Daniel chapter 2. And in verse, I'm reading to you from verse 10. The Chaldeans answered before the king. And said, there is not a man upon the earth that can show the king's matter. And then it says, therefore, there is no king, lord, nor ruler that asked such things at any magician or astrologer or Chaldean and it's a rare thing that the king requires and there is none other that can show each before the king except the gods whose dwelling is not with flesh for this cause the king was angry and very furious let's always check up ourselves when some things happen and then you get angry. Ask yourself, truly, really, between you and the Almighty God, should you be angry at something like this? Nebuchadnezzar, you forgot your dream. Whose fault? Is it our fault that you forgot your dream? And now you are telling us to remember the dream, to recall, recollect the dream. And you who had the dream, you cannot remember. And you think that we are bad people, you are still a good person. No king ever requires something like this from any man. And the man was furious and very angry. That's a terrible sin for us to be expecting the impossible from people. Expecting something that we know no human being can do. And we, if they don't do what we're telling them to do, and we know they don't have the ability, they don't have the resources, they don't have the intelligence, they don't have the capacity to do it, and we know it. No human being can do this thing. It's impossible, it's incredible. And yet, because they are not able to do the impossible, then we get angry. That's a sinful kind of anger. Here we come now to Jonah. We're coming to Jonah chapter 4. Jonah chapter 4. And I'm reading to you from verse 1. It says in verse 1, But he displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was very angry. Jonah was your problem. The Ninevites were created by God. And it was God that determined he wanted to destroy them because of their sin. And he sent you to go and warn them. And then those people repented. And God said, all right, I'm not going to destroy them again. And Jonah became angry because God showed mercy to other people. Jonah, God showed you mercy too. You were thrown into the sea and the whale swallowed you up. And the Lord preserved your life. And the Lord brought you to the shore. And then you glorified the Lord. If you have got mercy that you didn't marriage. Now the Nevites have got mercy that they didn't each marriage. Why don't you rejoice with them that rejoice? Why are you angry? And then we're told in verse 2, it says, And he prayed unto the Lord and said, I pray thee, O Lord, it was not this my saying when I was yet in my country, and therefore I fled before unto Tashish. For I knew that thou art a gracious God and merciful slow to anger and of great kindness and repentest the, thee of the evil. Therefore now, O Lord, take, I pray thee, my life from me. It says, even the blessing of life you have given me, I don't want it again. Take the life away from me. Kill me, destroy me. For it is better for me to die than to live. And then said the Lord, Doest thou well to be angry in this matter? Who is the creator of this Nineveh? Jonah. 
who determines the destiny of man? Jonah, what's, what's the problem with you? Why are you angry? Do you do well to be angry? Yes, I do well. And you know, God is such a merciful God. Then God made this big plant that, that covered him, a great shade. And then Jonah became happy. Happy at ordinary plant, but not happy at the uh, kind of uh, uh, the deliverance of Nineveh. And then the thing dried up, and then the heat came, and then it was like he was going to die of heat. Then in verse 9, after he got angry again, and God said unto Jonah, Dost, dost doest thou well to be angry for the God? And he said, I do well to be angry, even unto death. Then said the Lord, Thou hast pity on the God, which for, for which thou hast not labored, neither made to grow, which came up in a night and perished in a night. Should not I spare Nineveh, that great city, wherein are more than 600,000 persons that cannot discern between uh, their right hand and their left hand? also much cattle the question is as we look at our lives do we do well to be angry analyze all those past angers useless anger unnecessary anger something we should just have overlooked something we should have said i did that before myself and god forgive me i was as bad as that before and god has shown mercy unto me I thank God I'm not like this again. I'm going to be patient with this my friend, this my neighbor, this my brother, this my wife, or this my husband, or this my child. There will be no anger again. I said there will be no anger again. Love one another. Forgo all the anger. Let's have love and mercy with one another. Let's rise up and talk to the Lord in prayer. That God will help us. There's nothing to be angry at. You can be angry at sin. But you love your brother. You love your sister. God has forgiven you. Why don't you forgive your brother? God has uh, had mercy on you. Why don't you have mercy on your friend? Have mercy on the people around you. What are you accusing your husband that your husband has done? You cannot forgive. And you are getting angry and angry. I about you. Were it not for the grace of God in your own life, where would you be? Forgive one another. Love one another. The little child. What are you angry at? When you are in primary four, primary five, how did you behave? What was your life when you were also much, much younger? You were just like that. If God has changed you now, had mercy on you now, why don't you just forgo, forgive and forgo and forget all those things. Have mercy on your children. No more anger in our families. No more anger in our houses where we're living. What are we angry at? Anger will destroy us and kill us. Anger will destroy our relationships together. Love one another. 